fill in the blank. You're not getting any younger, so... Get uncomfortable now. (laughs) Hey you. Yes, you. Welcome to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast. A podcast for people who want to disrupt their lives for a good reason, to make it count. I'm your host, Jen Glantz, and every week I'll drop a new episode with stories from real people just like you who woke up one morning and decided to make big changes, starting with small things. We'll cover topics like entrepreneurship, love, failure, and self-care. Hey. You're not getting any younger, so let's make this an adventure. Ready? Why don't people ever ask you the important questions like, how many Ubers have you cried in the back seat of this month? Or how many cookies did you binge eat for dinner because you didn't want to spend money ordering takeout? Or how come you still aren't doing what you secretly want to do with your life? Or why is it so hard for you to say, I love you, or I'm sorry, when you feel it and you mean it in the moment? And why don't people ever ask you to tell them what's bothering you? What's really bothering you? Don't you know that we are all so bothered? That we are all so many things that nobody ever asks about? The last time someone asked you, hey, how are you? Why didn't you tell the truth? Why did you say you were doing good when you were not doing good? Why couldn't you just say, hey, I'm feeling terrible, feeling down, feeling weird, feeling things? People don't know what to do when you're honest. Last time I told someone I was feeling not okay, they told me that everybody has problems and that somehow I must just find a way to function. But that's the thing about it all. None of us are looking for answers. We're all sort of just looking for someone to listen, maybe hug us, mostly just remind us that nothing feels okay right now and that's okay. It's okay, my friend, to not be okay. Sometimes that person is a therapist. Meet Shannon Kalberg, a marriage and family therapist with a private practice in Los Angeles, California and an adjunct clinical professor at Pepperdine University. She's on the show today talking about things that most people feel, experience, or live full time, but keep as a complete secret. Welcome to the show, Shannon. Today is Friday. So Shannon, tell me, what was the best part of your week so far? The best part was... I actually closed on a house that we bought. How does that feel <laughs> this week. to have a house in your name? It's pretty bananas. I still haven't grasped it yet. And it was such a process getting there that I really need to sit down with it tonight and <laughs> really just take a breath about it. It's such a cool accomplishment. I think that a lot of people always think about what life would be like when they own things. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of us own cars or a lot of us own, I guess you can sort of own a college degree in the sense that like you pay for it. It's a very expensive piece of paper. (laughs) It seriously is. Like you think the paper would be made out of gold, but I think owning a house is a really awesome accomplishment. So that is really, really cool. Thank you. A fun fact about you that I learned recently is that you are a ballerina. I am. I was. Yes. Why do you say was? (laughs) It was such a large part of my life, and I have tried to get back into it, but it, I mean, when I was actually training, it was four to five hours a day, and my body was just going through all these different strenuous um, exercises, and It would take a lot to actually get back there, but what I do really bring with me is just the work ethic of a ballerina. For a while, you wanted to pursue it as a full-time career, right? I did. What was that? What was your What was your idea for that? What were you going to do with ballet? I really wanted to teach others the beauty of ballet and just the discipline and the artistry of it, but I started to realize that I had to pick if I wanted to do it really early on, and we're talking maybe 12, 13 years old, and you have to pick 
a training program to go into or you have to be accepted into one at that young age you have to know if you want to pursue ballet for real yep (laughs) what and it was way too much pressure for me so I loved reading I loved learning about the brain I loved talking to people so that's kind of what directed me towards therapy and I had this big big fascination with um, why people said things that they did or how they expressed emotions differently Uh, biology I love biology a lot so I had other interests and I always knew ballet was something I could come back to but just to pursue it professionally was a lot of pressure for a 12 year old (laughs) I feel like at age 12 you don't even know what you're going to do in high school for fun you know like you're 12 what do you know that's crazy boys were coming on the radars (laughs) yeah (laughs) boys are ballet I don't know boys are ballet (laughs) right another fun fact about you is that you just had a birthday and I did (laughs) I have a birthday too we all have birthdays but mine's coming up and I'm, I'm gonna be 30 And this is the first birthday where I feel really excited. And I always Mm. thought when 30 came, I'd be so depressed and upset. But I'm just honestly happy at this age to be alive and have what I have. But I want to know from you, why do you think that people feel negative about birthdays? Like, why do you think it's something that's hard for people to experience another year on this planet? I think that a lot of people see birthdays as a check-in time. And I also think that people have a checklist a lot of times of what I should have accomplished by a certain age. And it puts a lot, speaking of pressure, it puts a lot of pressure on that 20, 30 year old milestone. Mm -hmm. And we really have to sit down and recognize that everyone's on their own path and birthdays can be depressing sometimes. Yeah. (laughs) And people have an expectation of, oh, I should have all my loved ones and I should have this big blowout party. But it really is about sitting down and just looking at the progress that you've made since you were 25, since you were 20 and appreciating that. I cry every year on my birthday. Me too. (laughs) Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily because I'm sad or just because I don't really know what else to do with myself, you know? I I do feel like there's so much pressure, but I love how you said to sit down and just kind of recap what happened to you. And last year I had the best birthday ever because I went, I woke up really early. I went to a coffee shop. I took out a piece of paper, wrote down all of my goals for the year. I ended up doing none of those goals this year, (laughs) but that was a great way of sort of taking your birthday into your own hands. So I Mm. I think that's awesome. But yeah, we're both another year. (laughs) Whether you're older, hopefully wiser. Yes. Um, so I'm really excited to have you on the show today. And I wasn't really sure what to ask you because I could have so many hours with you. Um, you are a therapist. You have a lot of knowledge. You do so many cool things. And I was talking to my boyfriend, Adam, and I was like, what should I ask Shannon? I don't really know. And he was like, why don't you be honest about your own mental health journey? Because it's something you don't talk about. And it's something that perhaps this episode could really be focused on. So to open up about my journey, and I've kept this pretty private for the past year, but I suffered from depression. And all of a sudden, sometime last year, I hugged something hello called social anxiety. Mm. (laughs) When I was experiencing depression, I worked over time to keep it a secret from everybody. Mm -hmm. I felt like I couldn't do anything. I felt worthless. I wanted to give up. I felt all of these crazy things I had never felt before in my life. But it was such a struggle because I do live a very public life and I had to maintain this appearance of being so happy. I had to post on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I had to talk to people. I had to go on TV. I remember like even last year I posted stock photos on Instagram with captions like life is great, you know, (laughs) and secretly I'm like struggling. But Why do you think it's so hard for people to talk about their mental health? There is still a considerable amount of stigma around mental health and especially depression. And I've actually talked about this a lot with my clients because unfortunately I've had clients that have been let go of from their jobs or broken up with. And the thing that I really stress about depression is once you experience it the first time, it is overwhelming and it feels like your life has been put on pause. Mm -hmm. But the sooner we know what we're working with, we can learn to manage it. And I'm really into management of depression. And there's also another side of mental illness that we don't talk about, and that's the gifts of mental illness and what depression 
can open your eyes to and you see the world in a different lens and that's such a beautiful thing and lots of artists experience mental illness and it just think of it as opening up different pathways in your brain what are some of the gifts that come with realizing you have depression and treating it you can really see the beauty of life in terms of different polarization so whether it's a really dark day or a really light day and really appreciating how you need to plan to make yourself get out of bed just for the day you make a plan to get out of bed you eat a meal and you slowly are gentle with yourself and maybe during that time you pause and see what's underlying for my depression what are some triggers to my depression and how can I address those moving forward? Because otherwise, if everything was hunky-dory all the time, we wouldn't be able to see the beauty in the low points and the beauty in the high points. Everything would just be muted. I really love that. And I know for myself, I would celebrate accomplishments when I was feeling depressed. Like if I got out of bed that day, it was amazing. And if I opened my computer and did work, I deserved a gold star. And if I spoke to a human being, it was, you know, I should be an MVP. And (laughs) I think that I, myself personally, I set small goals to accomplish and it didn't necessarily pull me out of that state of mind, but it was all I could accomplish at the time. And that was really helpful. But what are the steps people should go through to admit that they're struggling? Because that's really, really hard to do. Mm-hmm. First, you have to sit with the emotions. And a lot of times clients ask me, well, what does that even mean when I feel numb? And I say, well, numb is a feeling. Mm. So tell me where you feel that. Do you feel heaviness on your chest? Do you feel tingling in your hands? Do you feel like you have a weighted vest on? Mm. Really walk me through the image or the scene that you have painted for yourself when you're in the depressive state. I really like that. And what's your advice about talking about it with other people? Because when I was going through my depression, my boyfriend was really the only one who knew. He took it upon himself to keep it a secret from everybody to protect me in a sense. But I found it very hard to admit to people. You know, I felt it was almost easier to pretend everything was okay than to talk about it. But How do you sit down with a friend or a family member or a loved one and say, hey, I'm not doing really well and I'm not sure what to do Mm -hmm. and I don't even know if I need your help, but I just want to say it out loud. That's a difficult one. And I wish we had a lot more resources for people when they are going through a depressive episode. But I'd say the first thing to do is identify people in your life that are going to be supportive of you because it can be really painful when you disclose to a boss or a family member and they use that against you. So first, I would suggest, you know, getting a piece of paper if you can and writing down two people that would be open to hearing your story and supporting you. And I think with depression, the most important thing is to have social interaction if you're up for it and them just coming over, sitting with you that can work wonders. It doesn't have to be, a lot of people think it's this grand gesture they have to do for somebody who's depressed, but just calling them on the phone, sending a funny photo, just letting them know that there's somebody out there who can connect with you is super important. Do you think it has to be somebody you know? Because I know, yeah, Yeah. I, I remember like when I was going through it, I didn't really want to talk about it with anyone I knew, but I felt like maybe if I met a stranger or, you know, I, I tell people about this that I know not at all, but I won't even tell my friends. So can you talk to strangers? And if so, what would you recommend for people to find support groups or other people to talk to about it? I love online groups like Facebook groups. Uh, there's Reddit groups. Mm-hmm. There's even if you were to look on Psychology Today or even um, online groups that meet up Uh, that would be good to do one in person. But I do also hear when clients feel like they can't even leave their house. And there are, like I said, the online forums that could help. Writing's huge. Mm -hmm. Writing down what you're feeling. Um, Free association writing is one of my favorites. (laughs) But there's lots of tools that you can utilize when you feel stuck in the depression. 
you treat people all day, Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because for you, you can justify saying that people who experience depression or anxiety or any other mental illness or situation, they're not alone. But yet when you're the person going through that situation, and this has happened to me where really bad things have happened, and I've said to myself, there is nobody in this world going through what I'm going Mm -hmm. through Mm -hmm. or worse. What advice do you have for people so that they don't feel so alone in their journey, even if their journey is so specific to something that they're experiencing? That's great. I'm really glad you brought that up. So there's a process that I kind of train my clients to go through when they're in this state where number one, it's identifying what you're feeling. So whether that be sadness, anger, rage, numbness. And then the second one is you have to tell yourself, I'm not alone. Even though I feel alone, I'm not alone. And other people have felt this before. And then the third thing is what can I do to take care of myself right now? So really having compassion for yourself and knowing that there's others that have been through it. Yeah, I think that's that's such good advice and it's so hard to do. And I know that when I was going through it, I thought, well, I can handle this. I was so against going to a therapist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had people tell me, like, you have to go. (laughs) And I would say, no way. I can handle this myself. I'm the strongest. But in reality, I couldn't fix it. And um, the first therapist I went to, I only went because (laughs) I got three free sessions with her. And I was like, you know, what's the worst that could happen? I'll go there. I'll cry. I'll leave. and I'll never see her again. But When is the right time for a person to reach out and find a therapist? So everyone's different, but if I were to think of it clinically, it's when your level of functioning is completely shot, when you can't muster the strength to get out of bed in the morning, it's really hard to go to work, your personal relationships are suffering, And then when you just don't feel like yourself anymore. Yeah. I think that's important too because not everyone feels anxiety or depression or even knows if that's what they have, but sometimes Mm -hmm. they feel things like being stuck or being miserable or just dealing with a situation that they just don't feel that they can deal with really themselves. So are those good reasons too to go to a therapist? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think whenever you're stuck with a dilemma and my rule of thumb is if you've thought about contacting a therapist three times... Mm -hmm after like you've seriously considered it three times, then you should reach out or at least consult. And maybe it's not the right time. I've had lots of people call and we kind of talk it through. They say, I'm not ready. And then they circle back six months later. Mm Yeah. No, I think the first one I went to, um, it wasn't the right time for me because someone in my life told me that she had gone to therapy and she said it only worked because she was ready for it to work. Mm -hmm. And when I was going to my three free sessions, I wasn't ready. Right. I wasn't ready to receive advice or to listen to anyone. So I ghosted her, which (laughs) means I never responded to her text messages ever again, which leads me to the question of when you go to a therapist and maybe after a couple of sessions with them, you realize it's just not a good fit. What do you do from there? I would really encourage the person to be honest with a therapist and just, it doesn't, a lot of people are afraid of hurting the therapist's feelings, but trust me, we feel it before you say it. Yeah. (laughs) So if we feel resistance or avoidance, it's so much more authentic and it's a learning lesson for you to be able to tell someone, look, I'm not ready for this. And I promise you, the therapist will appreciate it. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. And it's really, really mature to do also. Because the last thing you want to do is ghost a therapist. Because then you have that weighing (laughs) on your conscience. Like, okay, I'm suffering from all these things. And now I just did that. And we worry about you. (laughs) Yeah, I I feel that too. I mean, now I go to an angel therapist who I I love. And I feel like if I disappeared, she I hope she would care. But um, are there problems that you see that are more common in 2017 or 2018 with people? Like, are there new things people are coming in for more often than ever? I uh, Political climate, big Ooh. time, and social media. I think social media and relationships has steadily increased, but especially the political climate has been a big one. That Is that I've between noticed. couples or even just people who are so depressed over politics themselves? 
I think depressed about like the state of affairs or what's going on in the world and this doom and gloom that's going on. And it's hard because not to be selfish, but I am also upset about the political climate. And so I have to get my own support and then also help out my client who's really, really upset about this or triggered by stuff that's going on in the media. Yeah, I I have a rule where I try not to keep up with what's going on yeah. in the media because I think about it like if I did read the news or watch the news every day like a person might or they should, mm-hmm. I would be so messed up because some of the things going on as someone with anxiety and depression, I would I would literally be in like an underground bunker <laughs> thinking like this is going to end, yeah. you know? I mean, I think that that's that's crazy and with social media, what kind of problems do you see people come in with that? with the validation on social media yeah so whether that be validation for themselves am i good enough or does my partner talk about me do we curate the perfect looking life do i curate the life i want so it's all this comparison Mm. and i always say comparison is the thief of joy if you spend your time on social media and it's such a hole to get into But that's a really big problem that I see. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's a big problem because now we know more about people than ever. Yes. So even if you end a relationship with somebody, it's no longer like, okay, let them go live their life. Now Mm -hmm. you can creep on their social media life and become even more sucked into the spiral of breakups, you know? And Mm -hmm. I, I think that social media is so incredibly tough. But on the topic of comparing your life with people, do you see a lot of people who are end of their 20s, early 30s, who are not married, without kids, feeling like they are not living the right kind of life? Like, do you feel people compare like that at all? Absolutely. That is one of the top things that I speak to, particularly my female clients about, Mm -hmm. is, you know, they're very successful, they have these kick-ass jobs, but... They get pressure from either social media, their peers or family about, okay, when are you going to meet the right person? When are you going to have kids? Let's, you know, settle down. And it really invalidates all the hard work that the woman has put into her career. And it's so infuriating. And so I really try to highlight the success that they've had and how they did this all on their own. And this is such an exciting time to be in this day and age as a woman to accomplish all of this. And we see, you know, these trends in education where more women are getting PhDs and master's degrees and bachelor's degrees. And we're actually trying to break that glass ceiling. I mean, we're not there yet, Mm -hmm. but you're a part of that movement. And so I really, really try to help. It doesn't, it's not always successful because I think society has a really bad way of grooming women to the specific stereotype we're supposed to fit into. I could not agree more. And no one ever asks you like how many master's degrees or PhDs or like, (laughs) when's the last time you got a promotion at work? Or like, what's the last coolest project you worked on? I Mm -hmm. remember when I was single, and the only thing people would talk to me about was why I was still single. Why haven't I met the right person that, and I had a friend tell me that I really should consider having kids before 30 or else it's going to be really hard. How rude. Yeah. I mean, it was just like all of these things where even if you try not to listen to them and you try to ignore it, you still feel like everything you've accomplished is not important, you know? Mm -hmm. And I do have a personal question to ask you that I'm thinking about right now on the topic of success. Do you feel or do you see people who experience like crazy levels of success but feel so lonely by it? Yes. What is that about? Because (laughs) this has happened to me and this has happened to other people in my life. I had a friend, he's a famous author, and I remember he sat me down and we had a conversation after my first book was published because I said to him, I said, Jonathan, like I should be really happy about my book being out, but I feel this incredible feeling of loneliness and depression over this. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, every single major moment of success I've ever had has been the worst moment of my life. What is that about? You know what, Jen? I wish I could answer that question. <laughs> Why can't you be a psychic? 
<laughs> but I feel that so strongly. Yeah. I always think of my successes on a ladder yeah. with no ending. I just go from rung to rung to rung and it's just going up and up and up. And the only advice I've tried to take to heart and that maybe I can pass on is to really sit with your accomplishments and celebrate them. Go out to dinner, get a bottle of champagne, share with your loved ones um, that you've accomplished this. And one of the things that I've really learned through my own therapy is that our brains are hardwired to always search out for the negative in life. And that's because of our primal instincts that we still have, that our brain is trained, the the sympathetic nervous system is always like, okay, where's the next dangerous thing coming from? Is there a saber-toothed tiger around the corner? Mm. Is there a boulder coming toward us? So we're always on the defensive or on the alert of what's coming that's bad. So our brain actually can process negative things in something like two-thirds of a second, Whereas it takes our brain 10 full seconds to appreciate a positive stimulus. Wow. (laughs) That is mind blowing, but I can totally see that to be true because when a negative thing happens, you accept it, you know, you kind of hop on it. Right. But when a positive things happen, you question it. I mean, you said sit with your accomplishments. I can't. You can't. I literally can't. And it makes I also you uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable, and it also makes me uncomfortable when I try to celebrate them. Whenever, like when my my book came out last year, I had thought in my head it would be the best moment of my life to finally walk into Barnes and Noble and see the book. And when I got to Barnes and Noble and I saw the book, I felt nothing. I felt like that feeling of numb. Mm-hmm. All I could think about was awesome, here it is. What are you going to do next? Yep. And now people are going to ask you what you're going to do next, but you have absolutely no (laughs) plan, Jen. So you're in a really bad place. Right. And that was a really hard emotion to get over. And how do you trick your brain into being hardwired differently? I mean, can (laughs) you do that? It's difficult, but there is a way to train it. And so I think it's coming back to the thought and the theme of gratitude and Mm -hmm. really sitting down and listing out, this is what I did today, or this is what I've done in the last year or Mm -hmm. five years. And what I tend to do, there was this meditation I learned a while back where it's yourself split into three different people. Mm -hmm. It's your past self, your present self, and your future self. And you have conversations with each one And you kind of talk to your past self five years ago, and she's asking you questions about what's life like? Do I figure this thing out? What do Mm -hmm. I do? And you reassure and say, yes, you get all these things done. There's still questions that you have to answer, but you'll be okay. And it really forces you to sit with everything that you've done Mm -hmm. and take a minute because that's the hardest thing, right? Yeah, I think it is really hard. And I think, I mean, I'm just thinking about doing that before my my 30th birthday. And Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that I feel like I'd be really sad because a part of me would look at what I've accomplished. And this can be for anybody, whether what you've accomplished is getting a lot of promotions or getting married or having kids. I mean, I think I would look at that and be like, well, then what's, what am I going to do next or what's left? Mm -hmm. I mean, my brain is literally hardwired to be like, go, 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 don't stop. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting meditation to do where you just have those conversations. Um, you know, a big part of this podcast is about change and having Mm -hmm. people look at their lives, examine it and think of ways that they want to do something different, but change is not always something that flows so easy. So when you work with people who are experiencing big life changes, whether really good or really bad, what are some things you tell them to help them cope with change? So in order to cope with change, I always tell them it's going to be uncomfortable. So we have to really process through that anxiety and discomfort and think about what's it going to be on the other side. And if there's any avoidance or resistance, I really try to sit with them and go, what's that block coming up for you? What's that negative thought? Because a lot of times the negative thoughts are, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I'm not good enough, which I know we talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. Every day. And (laughs) so it's really giving yourself the evidence of why you're good enough, why you deserve this change. 
And if you're not ready, let's look at that. Let's look at what things do you need to put in place in order to make yourself ready for this next change. Yeah, I think one of the most common feelings that everyone feels is the feeling of being stuck. Yes. The feeling of looking at your life, recognizing there's things wrong with it, there's things I want to change, but not knowing what to do first. Mm -hmm. That's something that um, I think is hard for everyone to sort of get through. But if you do feel stuck, what are some things you can do to get out of that feeling or, or realize that it's at least temporary? Mm -hmm. So I, whenever a client is really feeling stuck, I go, okay, what's your goal? What is the goal you want? And they'll tell me some goal and I'll say, let's break it into tangible, realistic, specific, and time-bound steps Mm -hmm. for you. I like that. (laughs) That's really smart. And that's sort of what I did with this podcast because I was terrified to start it and I made every excuse. Mm -hmm. And so I literally opened up a Google Doc and I wrote down baby steps. And step one was think about the podcast. (laughs) Step two is (laughs) write down what it should be about. You know, like I I took maybe 167 steps so that I wasn't waking up in the morning thinking start a podcast, but that's just so overwhelming. So that's really awesome. Um, One of the things I've been struggling with as of last year, is social anxiety, which mm. is really weird because before in my life, I would walk into situations, rooms of people I didn't know. It was my job as a bridesmaid for hire to meet people all the time and pretend to be their friend. And then all of a sudden, I started facing social anxiety. And there was one particular moment last year where I went out with some friends of friends and I had a panic attack mm. because I was like, I cannot be surrounded by humans right now. And I remember you mentioned a while ago that you have breathing exercises. I do. That you maybe could share for people who are experiencing (laughs) any type of panic or anxiety happening in their life. Sure. So the way that I approach breathing exercises is you really have to breathe from your belly. Mm -hmm. So I call it belly breathing. And you you have to take three deep breaths in order to just regulate your system because when you have a panic attack it's on haywire right and whenever your anxiety is to that level there's no thinking that can be done there's no rational logical thinking so you first have to take breaths and calm your body down Mm -hmm. so the belly breathing is a good one making sure you breathe in three times and then there's also a meditation I like to do called the safe place or calm space meditation and you just envision this place that's very calming or safe to you and the more details you can pull from the better so if your safe place is a beach okay what beach what does the sand feel like what are the smells how do the waves look do you feel the waves or the mist what's going on and so I coach clients and I really say, okay, tell me more. Tell me more about what you're experiencing. And again, it's about really calming the body down so we can get to that place where we can start to problem solve the anxiety or the social anxiety in this case. Do you think that deep breaths heal a lot of problems that we have in our lives? (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) How come more people don't teach you just to do that? Because I think we're on this go, go, go treadmill, and we're afraid to be vulnerable. We're afraid to sit still and really check in with ourselves. Oh, it's so true. I can't meditate because when I meditate, I think of everything but the meditation. But (laughs) I teach public speaking, and a lot of times when I work with people with public speaking, they're so nervous. And I Mm -hmm. tell them, I'm going to cure your nerves with one (laughs) simple, free, easy tip, and it's just to take the deep breath. And I don't have a scientific background at all. I have a poetry background, but I tell them, and this could be a lie. I want, I want to know if you, if you can tell me if it's true, (laughs) but I tell them when you take a deep breath, it tricks your whole body into thinking you're okay. Yes. That's true. Yes. Okay. It regulates your nervous system. Got Mm -hmm. it. Cause remember that panic response about the saber toothed tiger coming after you. So that same response is triggered probably when someone's going up to do public speaking, Mm -hmm. but this isn't a tiger coming after you. You're not going to die. You're just going to get up in front of a room Mm -hmm. and speak. Yeah, which is actually probably scarier for some people (laughs) than the tiger (laughs) coming at you. But I've started to take deep breaths when I'm getting nervous. I was at uh, Disney a couple weeks ago, and Mm -hmm. we did the Tower of Terror. And on the ride, I I was practically going to die. And I just started 
taking deep breaths as it was falling and I got through it a lot better than I would have in the past. And Mm -hmm. I really do think that deep breaths are a cure for a lot of things. And we just never take the time to do them, no. you know? Even for, there's this thing called somatic experiencing. Mm-hmm. So when somebody has a pain in their stomach Ooh. or a pain in their chest, I always tell them, okay, I want you to take three deep breaths and I want you to vision envision the breath going to that pain and breaking it up. Oh. So you're directing the breath to the pain. I like that. I'm going to try that with my cramps. Yeah. (laughs) Every single month. That's really cool. So you are a licensed marriage and family therapist, which means that you work a lot with couples, right? Yes, I do. So relationships are, is a popular topic, no matter who you are and if you're having one or not. And there were some questions that came from the You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group that I want to ask you. Actually, the first question is mine. (laughs) Shoot, go for it. That I want to know. But how do you go about ending an argument with a spouse that you just feel like you're dragging on and on and on, especially because when you have been with a partner for a while, you know their pain points and you know how to push their buttons. Mm -hmm. So is there any type of mental trick or personal trick you can use to just end an argument and become a human again and get over it? So there's a technique I really like. It's called taking the wind out of their sails. I can't (laughs) wait to hear what this one is. So you know when you're arguing with your partner and it just escalates and escalates and it just goes back and forth? Yep. So what you're doing is triggering each other's defenses. And so you know exactly what to say to push the other person's buttons You know what you're doing. And so what's going to throw them off, but you being gentle or taking the wind out of their sails. So let's say they come at you with, you're always so difficult. And you could say, I understand. I know I'm being difficult in this moment. Can you tell me more about that? And then that'll completely catch them off guard. I promise. That is so interesting because usually they'd be expecting you to say, no, you're the difficult right, one, right? Right, And that's if you want to end the argument. If you just had enough and you see that you're not going anywhere. And although that may seem like you're giving in, it actually invites a productive dialogue. And then it'll throw them off and they'll go, yeah, well, you're always difficult around this time. What's going on for you? And you could say, well, my feelings are really hurt when you ignored me or Mm -hmm. you get to go deeper instead of just pinging insults back and forth. I like that. And it also lets you show that you take blame for yourself. You take responsibility. Yeah, you say, yeah, I'm not perfect. I am these things, you know? Mm -hmm. And I like that. I think that's really awesome. (laughs) I need to maybe start mentally doing that. It's still a work in progress for me. I, I feel that. I mean, I think that one of the things that's really hard is relationships are hard, you know? So hard. As somebody who's been single for a very long time (laughs) in their life, having a successful relationship, I feel like, is one of the biggest accomplishments because it is a really hard thing to do. You're integrating a person into your life, into your personal space, into who you are, and it could be really challenging. And I don't think people talk enough about that. No. One thing I tell my couples all the time is relationships are work constantly. And going back to the idealized life, people think that they meet the person, fall in love, get married, have babies, and things are fine. Or even after they just get married. But I've talked to so many couples where they say the first year of marriage is the hardest. I hear that a lot too. Because everything's over. You know, the the hype from the wedding, the honeymoon, and now you're just settling in. And relationships take constant work and something that Esther Perel said I'll reference her but she said your partner is always on loan and always up for renewal Mm -hmm. so you always have to work at keeping things new exciting or even adapting to changes that you see in your partner or that they see in you yeah that's such a good advice and I know um Another thing to remember is that your partner is human and you should treat them like a human. You should treat them like somebody that you are trying to, you know, impress and be kind to. Because I think sometimes I felt this, you get so comfortable that you just disregard them and, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't treat them with that kindness and it's really hard. Um, 
One person asked that she'd like to know if you have any insight in preparing a future spouse to live with your anxious tendencies. Ooh, be honest about your anxious tendencies. Really lay it out for them. And also give them a manual of what you need Mm -hmm. when you're going through the anxiety. You know, when you see me starting to clean obsessively, check in with me or see if I need anything. Like learn to recognize what my patterns are, and I'll do the same for you. And something I work with couples on a lot is this idea of a couple bubble. (laughs) And I know that sounds silly, but it's a bubble where the two of you feel safe and you're able to learn and anticipate each other's needs and what they expect from the relationship. So it's taking care of this family unit that you've created. How do you get into the couple bubble? (laughs) I I love that. (laughs) It's really building a solid foundation of safety. So things like, I hear you when you say this. I see you. And for when you argue, we're not going to stop arguing with our partner. That's unrealistic. But You hear that, Adam? (laughs) That's for you. (laughs) It's real. Yeah. And But you can tend to recognize when things activate your partner. Yeah. And just by saying, hey, Jen, I'm so sorry. I know you've had a long day. Um, Tell me about what's going on. Or even when you're escalated, saying, Jen, this isn't like you. What's really going on? Tell me the truth. (laughs) I would love for someone to say that. Like, Jen, this isn't like you. And I'm screaming at them. Because then I'll feel like, yeah, you're right. You know, it'll make (laughs) me feel. Who am I? Right. It'll make me feel like, yeah, I'm not the person who screams every single day. So that's, that's awesome technique. And I think... You know, one of the things that a lot of couples, I'm sure, struggle with is communication because yes. people communicate so differently. How do you bridge together two people's different types of communication skills? I think respect is always key, like you alluded to earlier. When I see couples fight and get really nasty mm-hmm. and name calling, I say, would you treat your boss this way or would you treat your neighbor this way? And maybe the answer is yes sometimes. (laughs) But (laughs) then it's like, all right, session's over. Good luck. (laughs) That's our off. (laughs) But really, you have to respect your partner and have that deep mutual respect. And one researcher, um, his name's John Gottman, and he's able to predict divorce with 90% accuracy. And his big thing is for every one negative interaction you have, you have to balance it out with five positive interactions. So you have to do some reparative work when you do have fights. And I really am against, I have certain rules in my session, like no name calling, no disrespectful language, just because that shouldn't be tolerated. Mm -hmm. And you should really respect your partner as a human yeah which which gets yeah. hard to do especially if you you know you do live with them um mm-hmm. somebody asked a question that i really i liked it was how has social media influenced marriages and relationships do you have couples come in who are fighting about social media and yes if so what are some <laughs> of the fights about i love this question so some of the fights are about making it instagram official if you <laughs> If you post a picture of us together, that means you're more committed. Do you remember my birthday? Do you give me a blurb and a shout out on my birthday? And what I tend to notice, and I hate to be judgmental about this, is the more couples talk each other up or flaunt each other, the more insecure they are. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I see a lot of people on Facebook posting daily. I love John. He's the best husband in the world. And you're like, did someone hack you? Or are you really saying that every single day? It gets like a little fishy to see that, right? It does. It does. And I think it's an overcompensation method that a lot of couples do. And yes, of course, I'd love to see your pictures of your honeymoon or when you got married. Because those are big milestone events. Your nice trip to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Awesome. But when it's that disingenuous thing it's it's kind of a gut feeling that you get when you see certain couples right and so that's something that always tips me off that oh maybe you know there's some insecurity issues going on and another thing that i see a lot um i don't know if this is directly related to social media but when partners snoop through each other's phones or their social media accounts which can be really damaging, and it's a huge trust violation. Yeah, I've definitely done that in the past, um, and it's gotten me nowhere good. 
you know, because it's just... It just hurts you, right? What are you looking for? Yeah, and if there's something for? there, you'll know it before you even have to do that, I right. feel like. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's just, it goes off of your own insecurity. So what are you insecure about in the relationship, exactly. right? And usually mm-hmm. that was something that I was doing wrong mm-hmm. that I figured maybe they were too, you know? Right, right. But that's really interesting. Someone asked about looking at marriage differently. They said that you can't look for marriage to fix or complete you, but it should be more of a steady support system while you continue to grow in life. But they asked this question because they felt like people were just getting married to hit a deadline. Yes. Do you see a lot of couples who are, they maybe got married young or they just got married to just get married and now it's sort of falling apart a little bit? Absolutely. And I feel like a conversation we had early on yeah. <laughs> in our friendship, you were talking about these brides that would do that too. Like, oh, well, everyone's here. Let's just get this over with. Yeah. But from my end, yes, I do see that. And I really, really try to help the couple be honest with each other mm-hmm. and say, is this something you can look at? Can you look at this person And think about in 10 years, what are we going to talk about? In 10 years, what are we going to have in common? How are we going to grow together? And I think it's so upsetting when I see couples just get married to check something off a checklist because it's inauthentic and the marriage might eventually crumble or it might grow into something else. We can't really tell the future, but we should always get married to someone when we're absolutely ready and not just because we're pressured to do so. A couple of years ago, I met this woman who I worked with and she told me that the first time she got married, she walked down the aisle and as she was walking down the aisle, she thought to herself, wow, this is going to suck to have to do again. <laughs> yep. And I'll never forget that because I was in my early 20s. I was dating the very wrong people who I thought were right. And I kept thinking to myself, I don't want to be her. You know, I don't want to walk down the aisle looking at somebody and thinking this is not right. And if that Mm -hmm. means I'm single for a very long time, if that means I never get married, fine. But I, that's something that I just never wanted to rush because a lot of people do. A Mm -hmm. lot of people do. And I'm not judging them. You can get married for any reason you want. You can have kids with whoever you want. Right. But it does add a whole layer of complication to your life when you start to realize that, you know, you could be miserable with that person. I made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot yeah. of things to make mistakes about, but I, you know, the other thing is you never know. You can marry the love of your life who's so perfect for you, but then 15 years down the road, you fall out of love yeah. or they cheat or, mm-hmm. you know, so I think what I've learned through my work and life is that, and you said it too, like nothing is guaranteed. Nothing is guaranteed. You sign right. a piece of paper, you wear a ring, but it doesn't mean that you're going to grow old together. Right. And I think that sort of complicates love and marriage too. I mean, do you ever see people who are just fearful that maybe they'll never meet somebody or people who are fearful that even if they met the right person, it's not going to work out? Yes, all the time. And that's something that, I mean, I hate to reference a cliche, but the only thing constant is change. And you have to really sit down with yourself and go, okay, this is someone that I enjoy spending my time with. I'm genuinely happy. I can't live too much in the future because then that's just perpetuating this anxiety. Yeah. And who knows? Nobody can tell the future about what's going to happen to me or my partner several years down the line. But as of right now, I feel like I could try this with this person. Yeah. I feel an alignment with this person. I like that because that's how I think too is you got to just try it. Yeah. I could have you on for hours, Shannon. You are so great. But I want to end with a quick lightning round. Yes. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions and feel free to respond however you would like. Okay. When you were a kid, what did you want to grow up to become? A ballerina. <laughs> what is your dream job now? I would love to write a book and continue to empower women through my work as a therapist. Amen to that. Mm. What advice would you give yourself at age 22 graduating from college? Stop drinking so much whiskey, dump that terrible boyfriend, and start to think about your future. (laughs) What advice do you wish you can give yourself now that you would actually listen to? Don't let the chatter influence you. And when I say chatter, I mean other people's opinions of what you should do, what you shouldn't do. 
really take those risks because there's no other time to do it than now. What's the best advice anyone has ever given you? Do something every single day that challenges you. What's the number one thing you want to accomplish this year? I want to start thinking about my book. It's going to (laughs) happen. Yes. Tell us about your number one moment of failure and how you kept pushing forward. When I graduated from college, I had zero plans and I was in a really bad headspace and I had to move back in with my parents and I really had to take a break and think about how am I going to accomplish my goals? How am I going to get to the next step? And it was truly a time when I worked through feeling stuck and I'm so thankful for that failure. You know, and if you can move through that feeling (laughs) once, you can definitely move through it again for sure. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so fill in the blank. You're not getting any younger. So get uncomfortable now. <laughs> Yay, Shannon, you're awesome. Tell everyone where they can find you and learn more about you. You can find me on my LA therapy slash Shannon Kalberg or on Instagram, my LA therapy. Awesome. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Hey, you. Thank you for listening to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of pods out there, so thank you for listening to this one. You can find the show notes for this week's episode up on our website, anyyounger.com. Subscribe, rate, and review that you're not getting any younger podcast on iTunes so that other ears around the world can listen too. Oh, and join our secret You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group, where over 1,000 people are talking about how to disrupt their lives for good reason to make it count. Until next week, all my love, Jen Glantz.